Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is a remarkable man, in my view, Simon Mordant, businessman and patron of the arts. Um, significant career in investment banking at the highest level, but also a patron and founding director and later chairman of the Museum of Contemporary Art, been a member of the board of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and is involved in the boards of Gout Galleries, both in Australia, the United States and Italy. Simon, welcome to the program. Thanks, Rob. Let, let me go to the first question, uh, which is, so I always try and ask uh, my guests, what do you understand liberalism to be from your point of view? You know, liberalism for me is more about a philosophy. Um, in the business world, it's a philosophy for me around free trade and free markets. Um, in society, it's around equality in terms of civil and human rights and around freedom of speech. Um, they're really the things that come to mind when you talk about liberalism. And you are a convinced small L liberal. Oh, very much so. Uh, in, in all those aspects that I highlighted, I, I very much believe in liberalism. Can I ask you why? Um, I, I think that in terms of a good society, we need these things. Um, we definitely need to have civil and human rights. Um, I think it's very important we have freedom of speech. Um, Economically, I believe in free trade and markets. I do have some concerns with liberalism and how it's being applied today in a number of areas. But as a philosophy, um, I don't think you can go far amiss with liberalism. Is your, con your conviction of the value of liberalism that it, it works better for human flourishing? Is that it, it's, it's, is it a practical concern or is it more theoretical? If it's applied concern? at the highest level, it works well for human society. When it's not applied well, and there are some instances at the moment where I don't think it's being applied so well, then I think it has consequences for society going forward. Okay. Well, I need to ask you, what, what do you have in mind, Simon, when you say well, not applied I think there well? are a couple of areas that concern me at the moment. Um, I'm very concerned about the growing divide between those that have and those that don't have, and the societal consequences of that. Um, that gap is getting wider, and I think some of the consequences of liberalism are perhaps causing that, and that worries me. It's often thought that a free society is one in which people get ahead in different, at different speeds, in which power becomes folk often concentrated upon those who, ha who have the abilities and, and uh, opportunities, and therefore liberalism can lead to a very non-equal society. Is that what you're, having, that, that what you're worried about? Yeah, but I think that um, the consequences today of that divide and you're right, you know, free markets do create those distortions. Um, however, I think there are some um, reasons why um, this divide is going to not only get wider, but the consequences of the divide are going to challenge society. So um, whilst I believe in luck and good fortune, um, I also believe that education is a very important aspect and education is not equal at the moment. And I also believe that um, you shouldn't have your destiny determined by the place that you're born in. And what we have at the moment without a totally liberalized globe is your place of birth often determines your destiny. And you know, being based in Europe for the last year, um, not only have I seen the consequences of COVID and the impact on those that don't have, 
is much greater than those that do have. But I've also seen the waves of migration um, by people from countries where they don't have the opportunities that we do, seeking prospects for themselves in a more liberalized society. Mm -hmm. And um, overlaying that with the way Australia treats um, migrants um, and disadvantaged people, that, that does cause me some concerns that liberalism by itself is not the only answer. Uh, many people uh, think that the, 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 the better answer is the government, uh, bigger and bigger government control and order. That's often put forward as the antidote to the problems of liberalism. Do you think? Yeah, right? I think the um, problem with that, Rob, is um, firstly, um, government is generally focused on being re-elected and therefore the electoral cycle um, determines policy mm. and policymakers aren't likely to focus on long-term initiatives. They're focused on initiatives that will be palatable to the community. And you're seeing that you know, in terms of things like the lockdowns, without regard to the societal consequences of that. Um, and, and secondly, larger government in itself, I don't think is the answer. Um, we're not attracting um, the right people with the right reasons into government. And therefore, I think business leaders and the community need to have a stronger voice in terms of some of the policy settings um, that are required to create a better society. And um, I am concerned that this divide between those that have and those that don't have may cause a breakdown in society um, over a period of time. Do you give any credence to the argument that people like Frederick Hayek and others made that not only that there's, a, there's an intrinsic problem with top-down solutions is that no one can ever know enough, have enough knowledge. And that's why you need a, a dispersed authority with particularly the price signals and individuals dealing with their own situation is a more effective way to distribute resources than by government decision or bureaucratic thoughtfulness, no matter how well-intentioned. Yeah, I think I, I don't think you can have a society without government, but you've got to no, overlay... You've got to overlay some element of long-term strategic vision. Right. And the government seldom does that. And you, you've got to overlay some empathy and um, understanding of what type of society you're trying to create. And um, you know, if, if I think about Australia, um, I was very excited when Kevin Rudd announced a 2020 vision. Um, because yeah, that hasn't been done in Australia for so long. And I think people are prepared to take pain if they know what the light on the hill is. I, I don't think 2020 was executed well and the follow-up post was not great. Um, but I think people need a vision. They need to know where the country is heading and they need to know where leadership wants to take it um, over a long-term view, and companies have ten-year plans, yes, and they take they take their stakeholders on that journey. Um, government seldom has ten-year vision, and never takes the community on that journey. Uh, is of course one of the troubles is that the citizens of a country aren't the employees of the country, and therefore don't always do <laughs> what. There's more. This is much easier to control a company than it is to control a nation. In fact, one would not want to have a nation controlled like a company. And that may even be, um, you're almost arguing for autocracy <laughs> as being a better form of government, less less short term, uh, less electoral cycles. You're not really arguing for, for autocracy, are you, Simon? No, but some people would argue that um, communism has some elements that are um, more attractive than liberalism. Such as? Well, but such as the fact that they get on with it um, and um, 
you know, ultimately the people, the people will demand change. And, and you saw that when, with East Germany when the wall came down. You saw that with the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Um, people power at the end of the day um, is very strong. Yes. And you know, in a company sense, if you put that in a company world, um, shareholders can remove the board. And um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have that same sense of engagement as an electorate yes. um, who are demanding a vision and a direction. Can you think of somewhere in the, in the world where you've seen a vision and direction that, that has worked well? from a government. Can you think, think of a positive example? I think um, what Merkel did in Germany um, mm. over the last 10 years um, has been quite extraordinary, um, both, both in terms of um, absorbing massive waves of migration from East Germany and then um, from Africa um, and the Middle East um, but also economically to place Germany at the center of Europe and to have a very strong economic case. And she also placed the art centrally during the COVID crisis. The German government gave 5 billion euro to the art sector. Um, yeah, those are elements of government that I find very attractive. I have a time to nor the knowledge to explore that further with you. Can I, can I switch to the question of the arts? Because as well as being a man, uh, a businessman, you are a, a lover of, patron of, and you've been involved in the administration of the creative arts. Can you just can I ask you, um, how important is liberalism for the arts? Well, I think liberalism in the arts is essential. And we've had a few instances where um, there's been a breakdown in that connection. But I think artists are able to observe and express the world um, in a different way to us. And being able to speak to an artist about what's on their mind when they create a particular work, um, I find very appealing. And I love being around creative people. And much that I admire the likes of Van Gogh and Renoir, and I can read their diaries and letters as to what was on their mind at the time. I can't sit down and have a meal with them and talk to them. And the reason I have been drawn to contemporary art is that you can sit down with those creative people and understand what was on their mind, even if you don't like the particular piece of output. I'm Rob Forsyth. This is Liberalism in Question, and my guest today uh, is Simon Morden, businessman and lover of the contemporary patron of the contemporary arts. And uh, you've just been telling me that you, you 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 don't believe that the author is dead is a good idea for art. You like to have them alive. So you can ask them what's going on. I, I don't mind if they're dead, but I far <laughs> prefer if they're alive. A, a liberal society is one in which maximizes, consistent with the, the welfare of the society, human freedom and decision making. And in the arts, uh, this is, I think, very important. And yet often the arts need patronage. They need money from the government or from, in the old days, the Borgias, <laughs> in the case of, you know, wealthy people. The Medici. The Medici, exactly. Does this create, I think, a major problem for the arts that in a way they both uh, want to be independent and yet at the same time are dependent upon often very powerful forces and people? I think you have to have some boundaries. Um, you know, having been involved in arts administration for 30 years, I've always been very clear that my role is not on the curatorial side. Um, so I, I've never encouraged or advocated curatorially that that's really the role of management. And the role but, 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 of the by curatorial, you mean telling the artist what to do? Or telling the museum what to hang or what to buy. Um, right. Yeah, I think the role of the board is to assess risk in those situations. So, yeah, if 
the curatorial team want to put an exhibition that may contain something that could be offensive um, to some quarter of the community, then the role of the board is to deal with how to communicate that and how to mitigate risk around it, um, rather than to be involved in a um, position of censoring or, or advocating uh, a particular inclusion or exclusion. But so from, from your point of view, so Simon Monet, from your point of view, one of the roles of administration is to maintain the liberalism of the arts. Absolutely essential, uh, and to encourage diversity. And um, you know, one one of the challenges of um, collecting institutions is that they've been very white male um, dominated, and the collections don't represent the community of today. So, um, encouraging diversity is also a, a very important um, aspect yes. because we live in a diverse community. And people don't want to just see white male um, creative talent. They want to see diverse talent. Given the uh, fundamental place of artistic freedom, do you ever see any argument place for limitation in a liberal society of artistic freedom? Well, I, I think you have seen it challenged. You know, I, I can recollect uh, Bill Henson, who's one of Australia's great uh, photographers, photographists and represented Australia in Venice and the yes. Biennale. Um, he had a show that some parts of the community um, thought were pornographic. Um, the show was raided by the police um, and you know, caused a massive controversy until um, Malcolm Turnbull tried to calm the community down. And I, I think... Um, yeah, that's an example of where liberalism is challenged, but at the same time, you do need to overlay some common sense. And if you're going to present something that may challenge and um, cause disquiet with some elements of the community, you need to warn the community um, that if they enter this venue, they may see things that they don't... Um, feel comfortable with, and they should make the choice whether they wish to enter or not. A viewer beware um, warning. A viewer beware warning, correct. Yes. As, as you have on cigarette packages, you, you haven't banned the smoking of cigarettes, and you shouldn't ban you know, art, but you need to warn the viewer or the user um, that there may be things there that have consequences. Do you think there should be any limits ever? I'm thinking of pornography or of uh, what may be seen as uh, racist or uh, I'm trying to think of uh, extreme points of view that would be deeply troubling to many people and in some cases believing they cause harm. Yeah, I think there are cases where um, you know, censorship or uh, blocking is, is appropriate and it's something that I've found challenging with the social media debate that's been going on as to um, what people can post on social media and what they can't post. And, you know, my personal view is that media proprietors have for centuries determined what goes in their publications and have had a level of common sense as to what may be offensive and what may not be. Uh, occasionally they make mistakes and are challenged, but I, I think the social networks, which are far more uh, popular today than the traditional media outlets, also need to have some sense of um, editor editorship as to what they permit to go on platforms. And you know, if something is blatantly inaccurate, or highly offensive, I don't have a problem um, with those platforms um, not permitting the material to go there. Now, some some liberals will say um, that yeah. goes against free society, but yes. I, I think you have to have a level of common sense. Uh, Simon, um, this may be a slightly character in my question. In the past, the arts had this danger of censorship from those worried about 
immorality, sexual morality or inappropriate uh, immodesty. Today, it seems to me the threat is from the other side, as it were, from the, a more, the more woke movement. Uh, there's a new censoriousness. One even might say a new, a new spirit without being unfair on the Puritans, who were much better than, their, than they sound, um, a kind of new Puritanism in the arts. Do you worry about this? Firstly, am I right? Is, is, is there a danger from these concerns? And are you worried about it? There's a couple of things that um, I, I would say around the woke movement. My, my interpretation of the woke movement and its criticism of the art sector is more around that white male piece that I talked about before, that institutions are not showing or collecting um, what is more representative of society today. And I think that criticism is fair, and right. I think it's appropriate. Where, where I think woke might move into the danger zone for me is, as you flagged earlier, um, institutions are dependent on philanthropy, sponsors, and government in order to operate. And yes. the risk is that you have institutions become a magnet for activism. And the last 12 weeks, um, MoMA in New York, and I sit on the council there, and I'm deputy chair of PS1, um, has been protested on by arts activists. Um, in London, the Tate, and I sit on the council there, had BP as a major sponsor. And the consequences of artists challenging institutions um, is the risk that philanthropists and sponsors and government take their money and put it somewhere else. They're and challenging, am I right, they're challenging the benefactors because they don't like the benefactors' businesses. Um, they're challenging some board members because they're involved in industries that the artists um, disagree with. And, and you had this with the Sydney Biennale um, you know, yes. a few years yes. ago where Transfield was the major sponsor. In fact, Transfield's founder founded the Sydney Biennale. Um, yes. And Transfield had a contract to manage Manus Island. And a number of artists withdrew from the Biennale in protest. Um, and this was the I company involved with uh, looking after, after offshore detention for the uh, asylum seekers, yes. So it's uh, coming uh, from the artists. They're objecting to the people paying them if the people paying them have what the artists regard as uh, some moral, unacceptable moral uh, behaviours. Yeah, and, and the risk is you don't attract sponsors, you don't attract uh, supporters, um, and the institutions um, wither. And the consequence to the artist would be terrible. So I think um, I understand the concerns, and it's very, very challenging. Um, but you know, institutions today are becoming magnets for activism, whether they're public companies, um, art museums, even government. I think activism is um, going to be a bigger and bigger issue. And as you touched on, the woke movement um, is right at the forefront of that. And a threat, therefore, to artistic, well, effectively, to arti not artistic freedom, to artistic funding, which well, some, means artistic freedom. Some people will say that it's um, a, a threat to artistic freedom, um, but it's definitely a threat to funding. How interesting. Um, can, I, can I flip it round? Um, by the way, just thinking on that, by the way, if Leonardo didn't, was it the Medici or the Borgias who paid his way? Uh, he would, would, it, it would have been more difficult. I'm not saying that thing there today. To flip it, do you think if an artist's person, a personal behaviour is uh, inappropriate, questionable, that, that his, art, his or her art should be um, boycotted and removed? That's a, that's a very interesting question, Rob, and I'll give you a, a real example. Um, Chuck Close is an American artist. He's probably the greatest living male American artist. He's a quadriplegic. He's in a wheelchair. He paints with a brush in his mouth. Um, I visited him in his studio in New York. I know him pretty well. I collect his work. Um, 
he was accused of inappropriate behavior to one of his studio assistants. Yep. And um, I don't know how he could do that, given he's a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. But nevertheless, he's been accused of that. And I have a large Chuck Close hanging in my office in Sydney. And some of my staff came and saw me and said they'd like me to remove the work. Um, I, I should note that a number of museums took his work down when the accusations were made. Um, my, my position to the team was, um, number one, I know Chuck Close. He's a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. Um, I can't imagine that he's guilty of what he's been accused of. Um, if he's found guilty, um, then I will reassess. But the mere fact that he's been accused of inappropriate behavior, um, I'm not going to remove the work. And I held very firmly to that position mm -hmm. and everything's gone quiet. Um, I don't believe the matter's gone to court. Uh, given the age of Chuck Close, I'd be surprised if the matter goes to court. Um, but yeah, we have a community today and the speed of media is such that um, an accusation yes. is not a determination of an offence. It's extremely um, liberal, actually, the whole process. Although th this might be a case where dead artists are safer, be in the sense, if I might say so. Well, in, I'm, the I'm further not back sure you are, right. the further back you are, the less. Movement. Oh no. I'm not sure you're right. You've got no. a movement across Europe where statues are being removed from outside buildings, uh, outside universities, where the maker of the statue is being judged by today's standards. And um, you know, to the extent that they were dealing with um, col colonization yes, or yes, I um, think art's being removed and i think that's a very dangerous um lens to judge someone you know work that was created 300 years ago that dealt with slavery um was appropriate at the time it may not be appropriate to create that uh, work today but to remove it i i think that's tragic i mean that's censorship going to an extreme and you can go you could go right back to uh roman um persian Egyptian art, none of those societies were liberal societies, they were brutal societies, and some of the artists were, I guess that's what I meant, the further back the person, the more the art is allowed to stand in its own right, rather than being attached to the person. But, but I, I think today we've, we've got some challenges to liberalism and you know, work that was created centuries ago is now being removed, and I yes. think that's all. Simon Mordent, as we come towards the end, our time is running out. What do you think, therefore, is the best thing that should be done to protect liberalism? What, what call to arms do you, do you bring? I, I would um, bring to arms a need for a long-term vision um, to place liberalism in the context of what is long-term right for society. And I would overlay some empathy um, to deal with the challenges of the consequences of liberalism, which yes. is a growing divide between those that have and those that have not, and encourage liberalism to not just say it's a free market, but to recognize the distortions that are being created and deal with those distortions. In, in, order, in order that liberalism itself might flourish, is your view? Correct. Yes, yes. Right. you're not the first one of my guests who's suggested that. There are obviously great strength in liberalism, but there are some vulnerable points as well. And in the arts, uh, what do you think is the way forward to preserve the kind of liberalism which creativity can flourish? I think um, I, I would be encouraging institutions to recognise the importance of diversity um, and not only diversity in what they show, but diversity in terms of their audience. Um, but I think the arts have never been more important. If we want a innovative society, which I think is essential, um, then creativity and culture are at the core. And we have to do everything we can to support, nurture, and encourage creative talent. 
Simon Mordant, thank you very much. I've been speaking with Simon Mordant, who's both a businessman, investment banker of, of uh, significant note, but also, as you've heard, a passionate defender and, in, and leader in, in contemporary art around the world. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.